thank you for joining us. My name is Duration, and I'm the host of this think tech show, which is called Finding Our Future. And I'm here every other Wednesday at 1 p.m. interviewing someone I love and respect in the community just to get perspectives on progressive issues, sustainability, and ways that we can have a more um, secure and just and sustainable future. So today we have Kaniela Ng. Um, I think, to me, you're like semi-famous. You're like well-known in our circles, I think. And um, Kaniela was a really progressive politician that inspired at least a lot of young people that I you know, have worked with um, to get involved in politics and care more about progressive issues. So if you can introduce yourself, that would be awesome. Sure. Uh, thanks for having me, first of all. Yeah. I'm excited to be here. Uh, yeah, so I'm Kaniela Ng, and I think as you stated in the beginning, I'm a recovering politician. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, I started really early. So I got in office um, at 23 years old. Before that, I was working with Stanley Chang in the city council and, um, you know, work OHA in D.C. And then I saw someone in my home island who was elected as part of that Tea Party wave. Um, in 2010 and you know my my father passed away when I was young so like my mom had four kids and she had to figure out how to make it and we relied on all these programs like social security um, pretty much everything you think of food stamps um, and this dude wanted to cut all those programs right like drastically that's what he said in one of his questionnaires I was like oh I don't know if he really represents my values mm -hmm. one and he's like supported by all these de developers that are just wiping out our coastlines and making it not for normal local people, working people on, on my home island. So I decided to move home and take a shot. And we weren't supposed to win because we were outraised and outspent 10 to 1, but wow. knocked on every door and um, we ended up winning by quite a bit, 26%. So wow. Since then, we just kind of worked my way up the state house, um, you know, passing a lot of cool stuff. Marriage equality, we worked really hard on. Uh, the first 100% renewable energy goal in legalizing industrial hemp. And that's with like, a lot of help from all of our colleagues, of course. Um, but I started to realize like, there's only so much that can be done um, through this like, system that requires all this compromise. But like, meanwhile, you know, Wall Street doesn't really compromise. Uh, nature doesn't compromise. So if we're like, doing these incremental half measures, it's not really going to solve our most pressing problems. So, I have a three-year-old kid now. I have a six-month-old kid. Um, within their lifetime, Waikiki could be underwater. We can see a, up to six and a half foot sea level rise now is a new estimate, right? Um, so uh, a lot of my um, work now is around climate change or uh, fighting the climate crisis or at least the most um, vibrant effects of it and uh, helping folks out with like the indigenous movement, what's going on on Mauna Kea and making sure that we stop criminalizing the protectors of our planet. That's what I've been up to. Yeah. Long, long version. No, oh, yeah, there's so much there. I want to get into a lot of that. Um, but since we're talking about Mauna Kea, I remember I wanted to have someone on, my, on the show, but I couldn't find someone um, who had like been there and who had that deep ties and roots to the community. So if you could just share like a brief reflection from your time being up there with the protectors on the mountain, I would love that. Sure. So my role in the beginning was just to amplify. So one of the people that volunteered on my campaign, Mikey Inouye, um, non-Hawaiian great ally, he filmed this super gripping video of the first arrest of the Kupuna. And um, we were able to take that video and like, just get it way out there. So um, our friends on the Sanders campaign, the Warren campaign, um, Alex Ocasio-Cortez, who was a Justice Democrat with me when I ran for Congress, um, we had them, I had them retweet it, and within like a few days, it got over 2 million views, and we raised $200,000 wow. for the bail fund. Huge. Just off, and we just like got on the board of this bail fund like two weeks before that. So, um, you know, a good friend, Kevin Landers, got out, and he realized that like, you know, as a um, white man in Hawaii, mm -hmm. that's not from here, um, that if he's starting this great initiative, it, uh, it might be appropriate to get like a bunch of Kanaka Mali on, on the board. So yeah. it's like, I think I'm the only guy. So it's like a bunch of uh, you know, really strong wahine. And um, really quickly, we grew this out. And I think we've bailed out about 150 folks so far That's awesome. um, this year. Uh, a lot has to do with the Kia'i movement. Um, so that's been my role, a lot of amplifying, um, but also and then the bail fund, so on the ground organizing. And, um, you know, being up there, it's just, it's really humbling. It's, it's the 
first time I've seen this kind of focused energy uh, and it's like a chance where a lot of these people that are going up to the mono, like Native Hawaiians are like really downtown types. Like they never knew they had this like Aloha Aina or environmentalist side until now. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think this movement of like indigenous people and non-indigenous uh, or native people and non-native environmental allies, like that's how change has happened historically, even like in Prince Cool Heels time. So it's kind of this cool repeat of history. Yeah. But we got to figure out how to like keep it going because, exactly. you know, Oh, I love it. Everyone's stoked, dies out. Everyone's depressed again. Yeah. Um, like Okulea, Occupy. Yeah, Occupy, same thing. But the, then you just got to wait for like the next moment. But in the meantime, you have like um, governors that are zeroing out the HHL and stuff like that. So it's like, yeah. how do you build momentum. this? Yeah. How do you capture the momentum into a structure? It takes a lot of persistence. Right, Can so we that's just what I'm working show on. Show the pictures of the Mauna Kea folks that Kaniella was with on the screen. Um, and then. Yeah, if you can share also, like, what, like, what do you envision for your for the future of this movement? Like, how how would you like to see it move forward? And like, what would you like to see it? Uh, so in like an hour, I'm gonna have a meeting with a bunch of folks from different Native Hawaiian organizations and environmental organizations. We're gonna try to focus this. Not, I think there's like this this thing where it's like, okay, there's people on the streets. Now we gotta get them to the polls, and like, we gotta get them testifying in the legislature. But like. There's like 20 steps in between that that like we cannot ignore, totally. right? And like not everyone should be an, an advocate. Like we need activists. Mm -hmm. And like the Sunrise Movement is a good example of that for, cl for climate justice. Like they're not trying to, they're not building up a bunch of young active, like lobbyists. That's not their goal, right? Yeah. Their goal is you escalate it with like an action, like when you bird dog center Feinstein and let them yell at, she's like yelling at this kid, that video goes viral. And then you figure out a way to capture all those new um, public supporters into your movement and then continue it and then train up those new people so they can do it again and this cycle repeats until you grow 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 yeah now there's like hundreds of sunrise hubs across the u.s yeah um because the target isn't necessarily the decision makers all the time the mm -hmm. target is the public and mm -hmm. if you can change the public to be, have like to actively support your cause then you win and the win the electoral wins come easy the legislative wins come easy and without it like even if you get a, a legislative win it gets like reversed the next year or watered down um, right. because the public pressure isn't there. Yeah. So like when you look at the lunch counter sit-ins and like civil rights era, um, they're not, or Selma, they're not targeting politicians, they're targeting the public. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how like even the latest, the LGBTQ movement um, kind of all that same thing. Like we use legislation like marriage equality as a vehicle um, to organize around, but it shifts the conversation. So now climate change isn't just about us like driving less, and right. not using bags, it's also about transforming a system that incentivizes stuff. Yeah. And it's all because of these like few young kids. Yeah, I, I think what you said reminded me of this, um, I think it's Ian Lin, this is Civil Beat investigative reporter, and he's been around for a while, but he, I saw him on a panel and he said, like, what if, you know, we reported on politics as like the same way we did with sports? So we're like, Oh, Councilmember Fukunaga killed the styrofoam bill, and like just like characters and like enthusiasm and like play by plays and replays. Because if we did that, and I think that's what social media is so good at, like the Sunrise Movement, they have these like, they like basically get these great videos like Joe Biden, Senator Dianne Feinstein, like embarrass them because they're just being themselves and they're, they're not listening to young people and they're being disrespectful to the needs of the community. And like these 10, 15 second clips can go so viral on social media that they become this movement kind of like similar to how a sports creates conversation. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's like, I don't know, that's really fun for me to like see how social media, I know it has its downsides, but it's able to like move people to get energized about politics. Yeah. It's an interesting example because there's a lot of criticism about politics being a spectator sport, that's right? True. But like, I guess rather than like just like blue team, red team, you know, we're going to win this. Um, maybe more like fantasy sports, like fantasy football, like where people are pick their players and their issues, but they're actually invested in it personally. Yeah. It's like that's the goal, right? Yeah. Um, so it's not just like turning on the news and like watching the highlights, but you feel like you have skin in the game. Yeah. So that's what these movements are, are starting to do. Um, it's starting to be more about collective empowerment than just individual choices, which, you know, both are important. 
but like the fact is there are 10 corporations that like emit what is it 10 uh, there's a few corporations that are is responsible for like 70 percent of most. the carbon emissions so and the u.s military is like bigger than most countries right Crazy, um yeah. so uh, unless we're addressing these issues in like a holistic way um like demilitarization is is climate action right so um i think that's like what the young voices folks much even much younger than us are really pushing these days and it's, it's, it's like, so I, I titled this show Perspectives from, from a Recovering Politician because that's how you introduce yourself at the People's Congress this weekend. And I wanted to ask you why you say that. Like, what is it that you're recovering from? And how does, it, how does your perspective now differ from the way you felt when you were 20, 23, you said? 23 and one. Um, and you're, I'm guessing you're like one of the youngest ever state reps. So can you just share like that? journey that you had and where you are now yeah I mean I was like a lot of people from my cohort maybe you're a little bit younger maybe it's more like the Bernie stuff but like in 08 I was really engaged by the Obama campaign and he was like the change candidate right like oh he captured everyone on the left middle right whatever and uh, I got in thinking that like change was possible in the paradigm that he presented um, and you know, once he got in, it was like, I'm not letting any lobbyists in the White House. Three months later, he did. I'm not appointing any donors as ambassadors. He surely did. Like, all did his he promise donors. all that stuff? Yeah. And he, uh, well, <laughs> I mean, he had, like, the big banks actually vet all the people that he appointed um, into his, like, cabinet. And it, the first drone strike was, like, three days out. So I, at the time, wasn't, like, disillusioned because I was still, like, riding off of the high of, like, that campaign. Um, but, like, in retrospect, it's like, eh, is that really all necessary in order to create change? Like, you had both chambers. You had the Senate and the House and the White House, supermajorities. Like, we could have had Medicare for all. Yeah. We could have had meaningful climate action. But because of the way the donor and everything was set up, um, we didn't. Uh, so when I, like, that's now. That's my perspective now. But when I came in, I was still, like, believed in that like we can just all bring people together and kind of moderate our voices and win um and yeah we passed some bills like we passed same-day voter registration which was meaningful like on maui they used that to increase the turnout by 25 percent at flip the council um but like a lot of the stuff we did was too incremental like oh we're gonna economic justice and like we're writing about it in our in our newsletters but it's a 25 dollars food tax credit and like yeah that helps some people a little bit but like the rising For cost it days, doesn't even yeah. balance it off. Like, yeah. So it, it just, a lot of it seemed really disingenuous and like the need to compromise was really just a need to appease your donors. Yeah. So that's coming out, like coming out of the legislature, it's like, I know, like people are like, look, why don't we just elect more progressives or elect more Hawaiians? The thing is like, if you're not allowed to be Hawaiian or progressive in the legislature, mm -hmm. then what's the point? Like if you gotta suspend that self or compromise a part of yourself, um, we should really be focusing on creating an environment that welcomes um, those kinds of perspectives. So how do you, I mean, it sounds like there's a, there's a deep brokenness about the system. So, I mean, you've been in it for several years and now you're out. So what is, what do you feel is the healing that's needed? Like if, if these few things were fixed and healed, um, what, like then you would feel comfortable going back into that system to enact an action. Yeah. I mean, I think we all have our roles and even like people within the system are like our allies and you know, I'm not saying like it doesn't work. It's just like people are going to be like, honey, like, you got to be balanced. But the thing is, yeah, it's just so off balance right now. Right. Like if this is Star Wars, it'd be like full empire right now. <laughs> like, yeah, you totally. Need, and like the Jedis were asleep for a long time because they felt like they weren't needed. But like right. sometimes you need that like hardcore people that are going to lay it out. I keep hearing the Jedi just to balance, analogy. Just to balance it out, right? Yeah. It's not like, like the balance isn't there. Like these, you, I can, it, it, I'm not going to name names, but you can easily find like five people on this street or this street or five to maybe 20 people that are also on every like nonprofit board that matters um, and are the largest donors. And it's like, it doesn't have to be that way. Like the things that Bernie Sanders talks about, how three men have more wealth than 50% of Americans. It's not, we're not immune to that here, and especially when it comes to power. Um, and so I think, you know, when we're looking at like elections or the legislature, 
let's actually look at real power in real terms, like what this, who's actually calling the shots. Right. And so, I mean, it sounds like some of that is like fixing how donations work. I know there's a lot of regulations, but it, it seems like there's potential there to reduce the amount um, that corporations can influence a politician. Yeah, and those things matter. Like we had good bills. Like I ran as a publicly funded candidate. I know there's, there's, um, you know, we propose what Andrew Yang is proposing now. Those uh, democracy dollars or vouchers. Yeah. Like we proposed that like five years ago. That's awesome. Um, publicly funded campaigns, like full comprehensive public funding. Like mm -hmm. those are good things. Um, but if they don't have the public support, they're not going to move. Like it has to outweigh the donor influence. Um, and the same for like. You know, people wanted rent control in our district mm -hmm. or like some form of it, like how California has. Yeah. Um, not like old school rent control that you know, life was housing stock, but a new kind. Um, and we propose a bill, and then it's just the Realtors Association, which are a lot of good people. I agree with them on a lot of stuff, but like there's no one on the other side representing renters. Yeah, um, exactly. And you do like a living wage bill, and there's like cool, like academic advocates, like, yeah, let's go, but there's no actually wage workers there. Right. And it's like, so how do you organize that, you know, without like, the unions right now, they're busy just protecting what they have. So, like, there's no worker center advocates. So, like, a lot of these organizing on the ground is going to be more important than these, like, imposing incremental legislation. Yeah. So, yes, there are fixes we can do within the system for, like, campaign finance and stuff. But unless it's, like, a movement of people, um, it, you know, it can only go so far. Okay. Well, we're going to take a quick break, and then we'll come right back. Aloha, I'm Catherine Knorr, and I'm the host of Much More on Medicine on Think Tech Hawaii. We talk about medical issues, and I interview guests regarding medical matters, and I'm really excited about upcoming guests. I hope you join us every other Wednesday at 3 p.m. Aloha, and see you then. Aloha, I'm Jane Sawyer with the Small Business Administration and one of your hosts for Adventures in Small Business a partnership with ThinkTech and with the Hawaii Small Business Development Center, the Mink Center for Business and Leadership, and the Veteran Business Outreach Center, all serving small businesses in Hawaii and telling you the story about their strategies, their ideas, their drive, and the way they help Hawaii succeed and be a bright light in small business. You'll find it here every Thursday at ThinkTech. Thanks for joining us, and we hope to see you soon. Thanks for joining us. My name is Duration. I'm the host of Think Tech Hawaii show Finding Our Future. It's here every other Wednesday at 1 o'clock. And today I'm here with Kaniela Ng. So we were talking about politics and change and the challenges and opportunities that exist within our existing framework. And I would like to, I guess I want your feedback because I'm, I'm interested in getting more progressive people into politics. I think that that's kind of my lesson as a 27-year-old activist been doing activism for 12 years, it just seems like we need better people in there to not have to convince. Like, they're convinced, so we know we have a vote instead of like, you know, it's like, it just seems like so yeah. inefficient to be like convincing conservative, corporate, bought out people that like people matter and, the, and climate crisis is urgent. Yeah. So, you can't force someone to care. Yeah, so it seems like you're kind of like in, you're kind of sharing multiple perspectives of like, you know, you can't do everything from inside, but we do need more people in there. So like, me what your thoughts are. Yeah, I don't want to, like, I, I think when I say, like, focus on the public opinion, yeah. like, that's really important, but look what happened with, like, the Obama campaign or the Bernie campaign. Like, Justice Democrat, um, who, like, were monumental in getting Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez um, elected, those are volunteers from the Bernie campaign. Like, mm -hmm. so was the Sunrise Movement. Mm -hmm. And the Bernie campaign arguably came from the energy of the Occupy movement, right? right. The 99%, his whole messaging. Right, right, so, right. like, it, it's all kind of connected, the inside, outside, and they reinforce off each other. And candidates are part of movements. Movements are part of, like, the candidates' energy. And movements are within larger movements throughout history. Like, we're all just kind of following our ancestors' footsteps. So, yeah, exactly. um, uh, yeah I think it's, like, all the above. Um, if you run a really... We, we still live in a really individualistic society. Mm -hmm. So, like... Ironically, these individual electoral campaigns around one person can create like this collective community. Like that's how our campaign, even though we lost, we had like 400 people out on election day sign waving and we we're doing like over 1,200 doors a day towards the last few weeks. Right. Um, unfortunately for us, 
our momentum peaked when 75% of people already submitted their ballots because yeah. of the early voting. But, um, but it shows that, like, and then a lot of those candidates are, like, trying to, looking to run for office now. A lot of those volunteers, or they're, like, moving up in high-level activism. So it's all connected. I'm with you that, like, if we got people that, like, saw the world the same way as us, mm -hmm. um, it would be a lot easier. Um, but it, that can't just, it can't be all the eggs in the basket, right? Because, yeah. like, Justice Democrats, their goal was to flip 400 some seats. Um, yeah. They got a few, a few wins, and um, just those wins already changed American politics. Totally. Like, fully, right? Like, the, 100%, they, like yeah. yeah, they like the, So it, it helps to shoot big. Right. Because if you think incrementally, and the other side is like, Koch brothers, we're gonna, you know, sell out everyone and build a wall, and right. immigrants are bad, and all that stuff. Um, we're going to lose because the compromise is going to be over here. Mm -hmm. So you got to hold it down. Mm -hmm. And I want to go back to what you had said before that you were saying how people inside the legislature were like, oh, you know, you have to be balanced. And you were like, you know, there's no balance right now. And so what I took from that is that if you say balance in the way that powerful people wanted, then you're basically maintaining a status quo that's not taking care of people on the planet. And I... I really like that because AOC says something along the same lines. Is like, everyone's like, she's a radical leftist socialist. And it's like, she says, like, I'm not moving the party far left. I'm moving the party back home. Because I think the Democratic Party and any movement that claims to be pro progressive isn't truly progressive if people are still suffering and not being taken care of. And so I think that's really important is not to, like, claim this identity as, like, left or right, but to say, like, where are our values and are we still there? Right. And I think that's like really what we need to do in Hawaii as well. Yeah, that was our message. It was, you know, we're returning the party home. Or we're taking, we, in our campaign, we said coming back to our roots because like we, our Democratic Party, for example, comes from a really radical Labor, history. Yeah. Like we come from a history of struggle. Like mm -hmm. our, you know, people were shot and killed. Hanapebe massacre, like it was Native Hawaiians that rose up. Filipinos, like we, we brought together, they purposely separated us by, by race so we couldn't communicate with each other. But it's like, hey, we're gonna create this like pigeon so we can like figure this out <laughs> among oh, yeah. workers and come together. Um, and it worked, like we rose up and we took on the corporate establishment, corporate establishment and won and we created this political party um, even. And we did it before and we can do it again. Totally. What is your uh, sense on engagement of young people slash new voters? Like, do you feel like that's improving? I know we have one of the lowest voter turnouts, but like, do you have an optimistic sense for all of that? Uh, yeah, the thing about turnout in Hawaii is it's strange because we say we have the lowest turnout, but we don't. I mean, we do in the general election, but like, there's no action in the general election. But if you look at the primary election, oh. we're actually one of the highest turnouts in the nation. Oh, no way. We're at like 25%, 26%. And yeah, primaries so, matter more in right, some ways. Right, right. So you look at AOC's district, which is also decided by a primary, right? It's Democrat plus 18 advantage. Um, yeah. Her turnout was around 2%. So when she says we're going to flip the people who vote, she only has to turn out 1% of the electoral, and that's a 50% skew of who actually votes. So right. that's a good strategy. For us, when you're talking about 25% of people, and um, it's, it's a lot harder to like, get new voters out. Um, it makes sense to target the people who vote regularly, and they happen to be richer. They happen to be from like, affluent areas and a lot older. Um, so that's where like, a lot of the campaigns, it's, like a reinforcing, it's a system that reinforces itself, right? Because we only target, we only engage the same. people, the same people over and over. Um, but yeah, it, it is a strange myth. Like, my race, we needed 50 thousand people to win if it was one-on-one, -on -one. Ocasio needed 10,000. So there are city council races oh, wow. that are like much bigger. That's like the state senate, Julia Salazar, from her same district in the Bronx, um, needed more votes to win in this congressional seat. So it's, it's a, uh, I think people got to look at the numbers a little bit more. Well, I think it's like understanding that primaries matter more in mm -hmm. Hawaii because Basically, everyone's a Democrat, and so the primary is where you get the winner. Right. And it's almost like the general is just like an obligatory pretend thing for a lot of reasons. Right, but when you, a lot of focus is like, oh, we, we're like not turning out, and like we're scolding young people. Like if you only came out, and it's like, first of all, you're not going to shame anyone into voting. So you got to meet them where they are. And then, yeah. um, and like rock the vote, that kind of stuff doesn't really work because like if you're talking about voting, the only people who are going to pay attention are like people who care about voting. You got to talk about something else. Like the whole brand should be different. Right. Um, and 
if you talk to a lot of people our age, like, you probably have friends who aren't, like, super political. I know I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, like, they don't really know what a primary election even is. No, they don't understand they don't any know of what the structures. It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they kind of know election day, but, like, if you talk about a primary, they're like, wait, what? what? I got to vote twice? <laughs> the same year? What? Yeah, it's confusing. Yeah. It's a lot of, like, vocab. And... I'm talking about people that like, went through law school and stuff. Oh, like, totally. They, even them, they're like, so I, I think it's more about that. Um, like, just un getting people to understand where, like, the power really lies. Right. So where do you want to focus your energy? I mean, what, I guess, where are you focusing your energy now? And now that you're not a politician, like, where do you see yourself best, being of best value to our community? Uh, yeah, so right now I have, I have two kids. I have a six-month-old and a three-year-old. So um, you know, my partner works full-time. So I, I stay home and I do contracts where I can, helping progressive causes, on the board of this bail fund. Um, and that, that's, that's where I want to be. I want to spend time with my baby. It's yeah. a lot of fun. Um, but down the line, I think when you're in office and you're like speaking against certain powerful institutions in Hawaii, you become a target um, in a very real way. Um, and what I want to help focus on right now is creating a movement that's not leaderless, but leaderful. So that there's really target people mm. to take down the whole thing right, right? Um, so doing a lot of trainings for organizers across the state because um, especially with Mauna Kea happening like this so this picture right now is that's the bail fund that's a bunch of the reason why they're all young men is because they separated uh, folks of different genders into different police stations and mm. um, I happened to meet them at Pearl City and bail them out um, a lot of these people are like willing to do more than just come out to a march, what but they're not necessarily like going to be um, giving testimony at a hearing. Like, right. That's not really where they see their role is. So like, how do you train them up to be new leaders? So that's mm -hmm. kind of be my role. That's interesting. Yeah, I'd love to see where that goes. Yeah. And um, do you have anything that you want people to feel or know? Like, what would be like a message that you put on a billboard or something that you would like want to share? You could share one message with. Everyone. I just want people to focus on climate change a little bit more in Hawaii. <laughs> I mean, everyone likes to, likes to talk about it. Um, like, you know, it's greenwash propaganda, like HECO, um, the state of Hawaii. But these are really um, folks that have been purposely slowing things down, I feel. And at yeah. this point, if I know there's, there's not one way to uh, you know, tackle this problem. I'm not going to say, like, we have, like, the best solutions. But if, if you think that we have 25 years to act, and you're saying 100% by 2045, and that's inconsistent with science, like that's climate denial, right? right. If, you, if you're saying that we can fix this with cap and trade or like a nominal carbon tax, that's inconsistent with economics, that's also climate denial. You can't just, like, you need a, a measure that's actually gonna rise to the scale of the problem because again, nature doesn't compromise. So um, I, I just hope folks understand that message, like how high the stakes are. And even in terms of real dollars, like we're gonna be paying billions and billions in the future. Um, and like, you know, the re climate refugees that would be coming here. Um, it's just the, it can't be overstated, really. Like, the risk is too high to not act right away in a meaningful way. So right that's a message to, like, um, you know, Senator Schatz, he's been an environmental champion for a long time, but I would love to see him, like, rise to the occasion and really champion, like, a Green New Deal-style legislation. Yeah, I totally agree. Urgent, rapid change. I mean, yeah. you know, want, waiting to see that. I think there's a growing movement. So thank you so much for being here with me. It was awesome just to interview you and hear all your thoughts. Oh, likewise. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks.